This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, the Dean of All Things STEM and STEAM, and this is Solve It for Kids, the podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now please welcome to the show my podcast partner, Galactic Space Geek, Jeff Ganya. Hello, Jennifer, and hello, listeners. Well, if you were hoping that this week's episode would be an exciting one, we have got the right guest for you today. We certainly do. What problem are we solving today? What does a primatologist do? What does a primatologist do? This is going to be a fantastic discussion. Who is our guest today, Jeff? Our guest today is the terrific Dr. Maria Mayor. She is the Director of Exploration and Science Communication for Florida International University. She is also a National Geographic Explorer. Welcome to the show, Dr. Maria. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) (laughs) We are excited to have you and we have so much to talk about. I mean, you discovered a whole new species, which is so (laughs) awesome, but I like to start from the beginning. Were you always a kid who liked to be outdoors and did you always like primates? (laughs) So I'm kind of a weird one. (laughs) Ah, okay. Okay. (laughs) Good start. (laughs) I loved being outdoors. I was pretty much a street kid (laughs) from the time that I could pretty much, you know, get out there on my own. But I grew up in a big city. I grew up in Miami, Florida, uh, an area called Little Havana, where there were a lot of Cuban immigrants. And my mom, who is herself a Cuban immigrant, was super overprotective. So I remember asking her if I could join the Girl Scouts. And she said, no way. That's far too dangerous. Right. Girl Scouts. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Can you believe it? So talk about being sheltered that way. So I didn't grow up, you know, camping and hiking and doing all the things that I probably would have really loved to do. But Funny enough, kind of like my friend, Dr. Jane Goodall, which a lot of your listeners probably have heard of. That's Um, a pretty prestigious friend there. Yes. (laughs) Yes, she is. Wow. I I like to keep her name in my back pocket. But no, what I love is that she also spent a lot of time up in a tree in her backyard. And that was me as a kid. I had a mango tree and I'd sit up there and I'd watch the birds and I'd catch lizards and always release them. But (laughs) I really just loved being out in nature. That's awesome. Okay. So, so as you were growing up, did you also gravitate towards science classes in say middle school and high school, or was it more just a personal interest and not so much school? So I didn't view nature really connected to science. And the Ah, other thing that I didn't view was me myself as this overprotected, you know, total, (laughs) total girly girl as a scientist, because there weren't a lot of women scientists yes. featured in my textbooks and there yes. weren't a lot of female science teachers. And so I'll be honest with you. I was, I loved English. I loved art. I okay. was interested in theater, all of these things that obviously like I thought at the time had nothing to do with science. What's interesting is when I got to college, I had to take a science requirement. Right. And okay. I ended up choosing anthropology simply because it fit my uh, schedule. No other reason. <laughs> wow. It just fit my schedule. Fit the schedule. And it was there that I discovered that my love of the outdoors and adventure and exploration, plus my love of animals, because I really was obsessed. I was an right. animal obsessed kid. Okay. I had lots of pets, dogs, yeah. cats birds, fish, and a pet chicken named Margarita. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. 
But it was in that class that I saw people like Jane Goodall. I saw people right. like Diane Fossey and Rudy Galdikas. Yep. And I suddenly had this, we'll call it an aha moment where I realized that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. That's fantastic. That's, That's amazing. Yes. With a class that just fit into your schedule. Right. That's right. unbelievable. But it what's is. amazing is, is that that background, you know, the other passions I had, like, you know, English and literature. So I had strong yes. writing skills. Right. I, was, I was actually a pre-law student. So, oh, wow. you know, good way to set up arguments. Fit perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm also, you know, daughter of a Cuban mom. So definitely know how to argue. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know then, which is, of course, what I know now, is that those skills would come in really handy because as a scientist, writing is a huge component. Yes. Because you have to write scientific grants yep. and you have to sort of argue the position that what you're applying to do is a very important and worthwhile research that needs to be funded. And so all of these interests that I had leading up to that moment where I discovered science was my path. Wow. We all came together. That's fantastic. You know, cause we've talked about it on the show before too. So I was in Girl Scouts and I did all those camping Lucky and all that you. kind of stuff. I know. Right. <laughs> but I don't now go out and camp like you do. So now I'm, you know, my, my campground is the nearest hotel kind of thing. So you don't, you don't <laughs> hang a tent 14,000 up of feet up. You know, I, I, I do cliff. not. No. I do not. <laughs> that is not yeah. on my to-do list. I, I heavily admire people that do that. But what I like is that you can find science and that's kind of what we talk about on the show. You can find science kind of later in life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You don't have to come to it. But now I want to know how you transition from that into primates. How did you, did you is that your main <laughs> focus or are it you just is. kind of stumbled into it? So my transition is kind of even bigger than that because while I was in college, I was also an NFL cheerleader for the Miami Dolphins. How cool. Okay. And so talk about really making a leap into the sciences <laughs> because you bring up a really good point. You can find science or science can find you yes. basically at any point in life. Yes. And I think it was really intimidating thinking, oh, but all these other people have been doing, you know, really focused on science like their whole right. lives. And right. I always tell, especially young girls who think, oh, but I'm a dancer or I'm an artist or, right. you know, don't ever put yourself in a box that you don't have to be pigeonholed. You yes. can have no. all these interests and talents and all of these other things. And you can still be a scientist. Yes. But, but now, yes, my focus is on primates. So anthropology, which is where this all began. Yes. Is literally the study of man. Anthro. Yep. Right. And, and then ology, the study of. So it's it's the study of man. And we are primates. Yes. And so primates was a huge subsection of the course. And when I started learning. Wow. About just how many of these primates are on the verge of extinction. And so many of them uh, had never yeah. been studied. Some of them had never even been photographed that that is what really oh, wow. captured my attention. Yeah. I so didn't realize I that. Yeah. I did not realize that. Wow. And that's a remarkable to know that was exactly the thing. Some of the details of some of them that hadn't been even photographed. And the fact that that caught your attention. So from that class, where did you take off from college? So for my first expedition, I went off to South America, wow. in particular okay. Guyana. And I went to okay. the most remote and unexplored region of the Amazon. For my very first expedition. Oh, wow. I, wow. I had <laughs> never jump left right the in. country. Yeah, we I was going to say. I, I had and never you're been out of the country. camping. Talk and about I had never camping. been camping. <laughs> and I had all the wrong gear. But what I had <laughs> was this like really amazing passion and curiosity for what I was about to do. And just this determination that no matter what, I was going to do it. And so I got there. And yeah, there it was a steep learning curve, right? I mean, I was oh, in I'm the sure. middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> no electricity, no running water. I was learning like all the local culture while right. trying to find my way. And by the way, I have a terrible sense of direction. So I was using this compass <laughs> half the time, not really knowing where I was going. 
But what drew me and has always motivated me to the places that I choose is I want to go to places that hardly anyone has ever been to. And I want to look for animals that we know little to nothing about, or that people say, oh, those are impossible to find or study. Those are the ones that I want to go in after. Right. Which leads into the next question. Tell us about the species that you helped discover. So that was completely by accident, as most great (laughs) discoveries are. (laughs) I mean, That's the thing. Most of the time, you're not really planning on a discovery unless, you know, sometimes you're in a lab, right? Maybe you're doing medical research and you're trying to discover the cure for something. And so then you're planning that. But in nature, everything is sort of a wild surprise. And I mean, really, every day is different and you don't know what you're going to find out there. And I think that's the part that I love so much. So I was in Madagascar with a colleague. And I was studying the lemurs that I typically study, um, right. larger bodied ones. By the way, there used to be a lemur the size of a gorilla that has now, it's since been extinct since humans oh got there. Oh my gosh, but I did not know that. There were some pretty big lemurs out there. Uh, wow. The ones I study are more like kind of medium poodle size, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Those are That's the ones not- that I was out there searching for and, and doing my thing. But we set up these small little, they're called Sherman mammal traps. And okay. what we do with them is animals that are either nocturnal, little, shy. If you put a little bit of fruit in there, they tend to run in. And then in the mornings, you check all of the traps. You look right. and it doesn't hurt them. You right. look in, you see, oh, okay, there's this animal present in this area. And that's how we conduct a lot of these biodiversity surveys. And then we open it up and they run off and they tell their families this great adventure they had, like, oh my gosh. I and, up and, and, by, yeah. and by the way, don't go into one of those. After the food, right? the, <laughs> the banana was not worth it. The fruit's a trap. <laughs> But lo and behold, one day, I remember it because it was a super rainy morning. And typically on rainy nights, you don't get anything in these animals tend to hunker down and sit still. But I peeked in, not expecting to see anything. And these huge eyes were peering (gasps) back up at me. Uh, And it was this tiny little creature attached to those huge eyes, (laughs) a little mouse lemur. And the reason oh they have those gosh. is because they're nocturnal. So that was how we okay. made our discovery. That's fantastic. And were you yes. just like, oh my gosh, we don't know what this is. Yay. <laughs> so we were super excited. My colleague is Dr. Ed Lewis. He's at the Omaha Zoo, but also a scientist. We were also both like, okay, this is cool. This could be potentially a, you know, a very well big discovery of a small creature, (laughs) but we wanted to do it right. And so the way that you do it right, and you actually have to collect the data for that is you have to now find a whole lot more of them and you have to do genetic sampling and you have to run those samples back at a lab. And so you really have to now prove that what you have is a new species. And so we spent many, many more months doing all of this work up until the point where we were able to prove that this, in fact, was a brand new species to science. That's fabulous. Yes, very. And congratulations. Yes, congratulations. So so those many months, did you just stay in Madagascar that whole time or was that many trips back and forth? It was a combination of both. I mean, I used to live in Madagascar 10 months at a time sometimes. Oh, wow. Um, Okay. I I think with this particular discovery, I had also just accepted a position as National Geographic's first female wildlife correspondent. Yay! Which meant that I got to be at the, you know, televisual forefront as a woman, you know, waist deep in swamps and and doing all the stuff <laughs> that I do that so many times like we don't get to see I mean if yes. you think about it most of the people we see on TV doing that stuff are guys and yes. that's all cool but you know I wanted some representation for for those young girls out there who that sure. next generation absolutely sports, right so I remember I was going back and forth with that position so I would stay in Madagascar for a few months I'd go back out, maybe I'd shoot a 
documentary on sharks, you know, or go film giraffes in Namibia. And then I'd go back to Madagascar. Wow, Plus okay. there was a lot of stuff going on in the lab too, running all of right. the right. samples. So it takes a little while to get all that done, but it's obviously in the end, it was, it was well worth the wait. Oh, absolutely. So yay you for representing women. That's awesome. You know, and and that's another thing that girls can understand that this is what we can all do now. And it's different from when I was a kid, because like you, I actually had a female science teacher when I was in seventh grade, and it was very unusual Mm -hmm. at the time. And I still remember her name, Mrs. Roth, to this day. And she was awesome. amazing and made science fun. And, and see, my anthropology teacher was also a woman, which I think there you was go. oddly like a great help. Like she was super supportive of, you know, that that naive cheerleader who had never <laughs> been camping. Said, yeah, yeah, you can do it. Get out there. Get out there. Just, That's um, great. But I want to ask you, can you describe what the mouse lemur looks like since we're not a visual, although we will put a picture of it on our website page for this episode, but can you kind of describe how big is it? Okay. So it is very small, hence the name mouse, because it is not a mouse at all. It is a lemur and lemurs are primates that are found only on the island of Madagascar. Right. But because of its size, right, it has the name mouse lemur. It fits in the palm of your hand. It weighs less than two ounces. I mean, this thing is- Oh my gosh. And really, I would say most of its body weight is those big eyes that it uses at night to move around in the trees. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah, okay. That, and it's tiny. Yes. Two yeah. ounces. That is really small. So did you and your colleague get to name it a mouse mm-hmm. lemur? So the name, like the common name, just mouse lemur, right, which is very generic, that already existed. But okay. I got to name it, I call it Russell's mouse lemur. I named it after Dr. Russell Mittermeier, who is also a primatologist and who really helped give me my start on my oh, career. Like when nice. I was out there, okay. you know, searching for those primates that everyone said, oh, that's impossible. Right. He was the one like believing in me and saying like, yes, get out there and helping with the funding because he was also the president of an organization that I wrote grants to. So he got Wonderful. a little mouse lemur named after him. The joke now is, is that he wishes I discovered a bigger primate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I there's mean, yes. gratitude for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I was going to say, you know, him helping provide funding or getting you funding is the big thing. In, it's a big deal. It, it, is, it is a very big deal so that you could stay out there for your 10 months and go back and forth. So exactly. tell us a little more what you did for as a National Geographic Explorer. Can you talk about, I mean, did you dive with sharks or just, you know, yeah, all of these different, oh my gosh. Yeah. Tell us about so, that. <laughs> I've, done, I've done so much as a National Geographic Explorer that we would probably need about 20 more of these podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, hit the highlights. But, but like I'll tell you what National Geographic really did to help in this endeavor. So now I suddenly had this huge platform, right? right? Because it's a it's a yeah. global platform, yes. it's a global yes. audience. Sure. And so I approached the Prime Minister of Madagascar with this discovery because I, I was excited about the discovery, but I oh, felt like, yes. okay, but now what? Like, that's not enough. Like, if these forests disappear, right. if these animals go extinct, like, then what did it all matter? What did it all mean? And so through National Geographic, right, because the name carries a lot of weight, yes, I does. was able to approach the Prime Minister and basically convinced him to declare the area a national park. So that's now, awesome. you know, wow. not only was that little mouse lemur protected, but the thousands of the other species that live in that same rainforest were also protected. That's so that no was small one feat. Great thing. No, I always say this tiny little lemur became a huge ambassador yep. for all things wild in Madagascar. And so that to me was was really the big accomplishment in all of that. That That um, is, it's huge. But, but on the adventure side, yes, I've gone diving with great white sharks. I have captured giraffes in Namibia. I've worked with leopards. I have, wow. oh my goodness, I've come face to face, of course, with silverbacks. You know, I've been kind of- In the wild? Oh, yeah. 
Oh Whoa. yeah. I've been charged by gorillas at least 80 times. <laughs> wow. And nothing personal against me. That's just what. <laughs> so, okay. So what do you do when a gorilla is charging it? Do you stand still? Do you, so, I mean, 99% of the time you either stand still or you crouch and look very submissive and you pretend to eat leaves. You know, you kind of like, you become one of the gorillas like, yeah, yeah, I got uh, it. Okay. And okay. I am much weaker than you. And I am totally aware. That's what you do. <laughs> there was one remarkable Gosh. instance where that was not the thing to do. And my instincts kicked in and I got out of the gorilla's way <laughs> because okay. he, he was not messing around. But yeah, I've, wow. uh, and then I've done other expeditions where I've trekked over a thousand miles across Africa. I've wow. gotten to the top of a tapui in South America, which is sort of these lost worlds. I mean, there's a lot of unknown species. We've discovered right. a brand new frog species just in the last few years. It's wow. been really just an amazing adventure all the time. That sounds amazing. It wow. sounds like a lot of fun. Yes. One thing you said about back in Madagascar, after you discovered the new species, you asked yourself a question, and I'm guessing this was with your colleagues as well, but you asked yourself a question of now what? Mm -hmm. So we made the discovery, we did this sciencey thing, now what? And then the answer to that question is what you just told us about creating the national park. And you consider that to be the big accomplishment of, can you talk a little bit more about that for our younger listeners? I just think that you should always dream big. And then Mm. once you accomplish that dream, then dream bigger, right? So as a scientist, I think making a discovery is a pretty big dream. And I had done that and it would have probably been easy enough to leave it there. Like, okay, I, you know, just discovered the world's smallest primate. This is awesome. Dream come true and be done. But at that point, I felt like there's always more to do, right? And there's always more ways in which in this case you can help. And I saw this as a really big opportunity to what can we do to make the situation in Madagascar better? Because if you understand Madagascar, you have to think of it as a place. I mean, a lot of kids have seen the movie Madagascar. Yes. Um, so yes. They're familiar with the lemurs, although a lot of the animals in that movie, of course, are not in Madagascar. <laughs> um, <laughs> like there's no zebras what? or lions in Madagascar. Yes, yes. But, but Madagascar is this really special, unique place where it has more biodiversity than anywhere else on the planet, right? So that means that the number of unique animals and plant species are only found on this amazing island. And to me, the animals there look like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. So they're all really kind of (laughs) cool and weird and different. And it's such a special place, but it also is really threatened with, you know, like deforestation, logging, All the trees are being cut down, which means all these animals are losing their habitat. And if they don't have a habitat to live in, then these animals disappear. And that's where I saw that opportunity, like really knowing sort of where you're at, what you're studying, understanding that whole picture. And now here an opportunity presents itself where, wait, I could use this discovery to do something even bigger. And I think maybe the takeaway, which is more general because it applies to everything and everyone, is never sort of settle for the end game. There, you know, always push yourself and and see beyond the end game because there's always more. I like that. There is more. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's so many more things we could talk about with you, but what I want to talk about is is some of the outreach, because I think this leads right into what you were saying. Can you talk about some of the outreach programs that you do at FIU and how that works? So I moved back to Miami to become the director of science and exploration communications at the university, because one of the things that I think is really important is that scientists are able to communicate their science and the importance of their work and how everything that they're doing, whether it be in a lab or thousands of miles away in a very distant place, affects 
each and every one of our everyday lives. Yes. And scientists don't traditionally uh, have great communication skills. Like they're super smart and they're doing yes. amazing work. Yes. But they talk in a way that most people can't understand it or it's yes. like boring or not interesting. So sure. I thought this was an amazing opportunity to do this in a different way and to right. teach that next generation of scientists, how do we tell better stories about our science and get people excited about it and become role models for, for young girls or for anybody to become that next generation of explorers and, right. and scientists. And so that's what I'm doing at the university now. And it's something that I really love. Not only do I get to work with you know professors and, and graduate students, but I give a lot of lectures for young kids and, and audiences about basically the story I just told you guys, which right. is, you know, don't ever limit yourself, follow your passions, follow your dreams. If those happen to be in the scientific realm, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> if not, that's okay. And that's right. okay too, but they come away learning about, you know, scientific discovery, exploration, scientific method. And so that's always good too. Yeah. Well, well, it dovetails really well with what we do on our podcast here because we believe the same thing, which is why we provide a platform for scientists like you and engineers as well to talk about all their things, everything they do, because it's kind of fun. Like, I don't think Jeff and I can think of one podcast that we haven't enjoyed learning so much. Not and, a one. And then even you're doing it right. <laughs> the guests are like, wow, that wasn't hard that was fun right (laughs) you guys are fun yes and then thank you very kind thank you the number of people that are doing such cool things that so many people don't know about right like i was just thinking as you were answering jennifer's last question i was actually literally just thinking that you have done all these amazing things all around the world and you now currently have the job title of are you kidding Director of Exploration and Science Communication at a really cool university in Florida. Yes. That is another awesome job. It came full circle, right? Like I'm back home in Miami and I'm getting to really do what I love most, which is reach all these audiences, but now help other people reach all these audiences, which is, oh, and not only that. So now I also get to oversee the Women Explorers program. So that's also a lot of fun because talk about really setting up in the same way that I got launched into my career that those preliminary horrible grants to get, right? To get you (laughs) out the door when you have no experience or limited I get to now oversee this program and these grants and and see these young women head off into the field for the first time and conduct their their research. That's fantastic. Well, I just have to say, coming from a very sheltered background, you are now known as the female Indiana Jones. I think you've kind of <laughs> broken out of your little shelter mold there. The, just the a, other cool new just name a little I, bit. I, the other cool <laughs> new name I heard recently was there was a media outlet, Her Wildness. I thought, oh, there you go. Oh, Oh, like, like Dr. Earl's, her deepness. Exactly. So that's how it started. So Dr. Earl, another very good friend of mine who I adore. Yes. She and I were doing an event at FIU and there was some press coverage that came out and it was her deepness and her wildness. And I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. I love that. And she recently (laughs) sent me the coolest pair of pink diving boots, right? Wonderful. And she said, here are your pink boots to my ruby flippers. And I'm like, oh, Oh, that's fantastic. (laughs) You've reached it now. That's it. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) And since we are talking about wildness, can you tell us about Just Wild Enough? Also, Just Wild Enough is a book that just came out in September, and the author chose me to be the subject, and it's about my life growing up in a big city of Miami and sort of my unlikely dreams of following this path that that I got, you know, led down at some sure. point, right? <laughs> so that path of city kid to NFL cheerleader to National Geographic Explorer to renowned scientists, like that whole journey. And so the idea is that in the beginning, I think I was always wild at heart, but I yes. didn't, I wasn't okay. surrounded by the wilds, 
but I was just wild enough to keep pushing and pushing until finally I achieved her wildness. Nice. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. And that book is the author is Marta Magellan. And she is one of my friends, which is really cool. Marta, I met her many years ago that the college where she was working ran an interview about me in their magazine. And then I guess somehow we got connected. So yeah, it's it's like an amazing, I, uh, I also love that she's in my hometown. I thought yes. that made it very special yes. too. She, she's a, a great writer and a, and a really great person. So she was the best one to do this book for you, I think. Super honored she picked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we've reached the time in the show where we ask each of our guests to give our listeners a challenge. So I'm very curious to hear what your challenge might be. So this is a tricky one, but <laughs> I am going to challenge your listeners to put themselves in the, I will call them muddy boots of an explorer oh. Oh, okay. at least once a week, right? Put down the electronics, the whether it's iPads, Playstations, whatever, and spend a good amount of time outside just listening and observing and taking notes and really becoming a scientist and just try it on and see how that feels. Because I think that we're all born with this really amazing amount of curiosity. Yes. And I think that we all find peace in nature. So I think that for no matter how different everyone is, there are certain things that are just like in us all the yes. time. So embrace Agreed. that. And so yes. put yourselves in those muddy boots. They don't actually have to be muddy, but I call them, <laughs> I call them muddy boots when I'm out in the field and get out there. No matter where you live, you could live in a big city like I did and you could still find nature. You can still explore. You can still sit and listen and count the number of birds you see that day. And then maybe the next week compare, hey, am I seeing more birds, less birds, you know, any sort of animal, but sure. take notes, make little drawings and just Become yes. a scientist once a week and see how that yes. feels. I love that challenge. I think that's amazing. When I go to schools and talk about my science books, I, I like to give them that. I say, get outside and get inventing. All right. Watch. That's great. That's Watch it. what you do. This has been a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much for being on Salt for Kids, Dr. Maria. Thank you so much, you guys. Exciting was absolutely the word for it. How much fun is Dr. Maria? Oh my goodness, she's done so many different things. And if you didn't think you wanted to be an explorer like her, I bet you're thinking that way now. Oh, I am. Wow. She has a really exciting job, but I, jobs, right? Like, yes, jobs. jobs. She's done so <laughs> many different things and she's so excited about all of them. And of course, she's just getting started. So I think it's so cool. And I hope kids actually kind of look at some of the other things that Dr. Maria has done as well. And what about that challenge? How oh, cool. Yes. Get outside and get your boots muddy. Yep. I love this because it is so non-specific. And moms and dads, hopefully you give some leeway for younger listeners out there. But I was thinking about it when she said that. How frequently are we, especially you and I as grown-ups, we're jumping over the mud puddles. We're stepping around the snow in Colorado. We're trying to keep our boots clean. We're trying to keep the rain off of us. We're not actually outside exploring in it and enjoying it. I don't know. I'm still that kid who will walk through the snow and and make snow angels. Granted, I don't see much snow in Florida, so I'm very excited. <laughs> and to the absolute horror of my children, sometimes I make snow angels. But <laughs> why not? It's a They'll lot of get fun. There. And so any of you guys that go out and do this, I encourage you to actually leave us a message on our social media. We are at Kids Solve at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And also please check out our website where we'll have lots of information about Dr. Maria there it is solidforkids.com and don't forget that if you want to learn more there is a book list at the bottom so kids can learn more that's right and i love the book list every single time so much more to get into and i really hope one of our listeners sends us a picture of their muddy boots yes 
Until next time, you'll hear Jen and Jeff on Solve, Solve It, it for, for Kids. kids.